Hi, I'm Eric Green and welcome to I Eat Data Science for Breakfast. This is the first session in what hopes to be a, a seven or 10 week long uh, pandemic addition to our uh, I Eat Data Science for Breakfast workshop. I'm putting this together for uh, Duke University students and uh, friends of our program. Uh, but this workshop's for everybody. Uh, I'd say your mileage might vary because if you are an experienced R user, uh, there may not be as many new things for you right up front. Uh, gearing this more towards folks who are new to R, new to data science, trying to help folks get on the right track to figure out what R and data science are all about. About me, I'm a faculty member at uh, the Duke Global Health Institute. And I should say, and it's important to say this these days, I, I'm not an epidemiologist. My training is in uh, clinical psychology and I teach research uh, methods courses, uh, study behavior change, and I do dabble in uh, data science. The students in this seminar, uh, we do a live session uh, for them, uh, tend to be new R users. Uh, we have undergraduates, master's students, doctoral students, postdocs, and a few faculty members, and also some folks outside of uh, academia as well. Our goals in this session, well, one is to make you feel productive when you are obsessing over these COVID-19 charts. And I know you're looking at them, I'm looking at them. Uh, we see them in our Twitter feeds. And so if you're gonna spend so much time thinking about these plots, you should learn how to make some of them. Uh, two other goals, uh, to get you using R. And if you're a new R user, then just today alone, we're gonna meet this goal because I'm gonna have you uh, working in R and uh, starting to learn what it's all about. And I want to teach you enough about data science to know where to go next, uh, to know what data science is all about and what are some of the key skills you'll need to learn in uh, future studies. But we explicitly do not have a few goals. One is that I'm not trying to inform any debate about COVID-19. We're going to find interesting plots, try to reproduce them, but only as a motivation for learning R and data science. Some of these plots are gonna be wrong. Some of the data is probably gonna be out of date soon. So uh, the goal is not science, the goal is uh, education. The format will be weekly live sessions via Zoom, Friday at 9 a.m. And this is for students who are registered uh, with me. And uh, we'll hold office hours on Wednesdays at uh, 9 a.m. It'll be a combination of a few didactic bits, but with in-session coding practice. And as we go week after week, the, the amount of you practicing is going to go up and the amount of me talking is going to go down uh, because you'll know more and more to be able to build on. Today, you'll run some code that I have. Next week, you'll start to modify that code. Uh, we'll also come up with a weekly challenge, uh, an optional assignment to figure out if you can uh, try to reproduce uh, another uh, uh, figure that we find out there in the wild. Our weekly roadmap. So we're going to start today with getting started with R in our studio. Uh, since we're doing a plot-based course, sooner or later we've got to really dig into ggplot2. We're going to talk about that uh, plotting uh, package today a little bit, but next week we'll really dive into how it works. Uh, we'll look at importing and transforming data, which are uh, key tasks you have to be able to do before you can make any good plot. We'll look at techniques for exploratory data analysis. Uh, also look at interactive and animated plots. There's some great packages that make it uh, pretty easy. Uh, we'll also talk about relational data. Often you find data in different uh, silos, uh, different shapes, and we need to bring them together. So we'll talk about all the work you need for relational uh, data management. And then a few special topics. I think we'll talk about text mining. There's a great package uh, for that now. Uh, Flex dashboards uh, are a great easy way to make dashboards with the same uh, R markdown format that you're going to get used to in this course. Uh, we'll also look at the new suite of packages called tidy models. Uh, tidy models are a really easy way to get started with machine learning. Uh, and we'll finish up, I hope, talking about uh, more about reduce, reproducible workflows. And by the time we get there, I'll already have converted you to realizing how important that is. And we'll talk about the skills to be able to do it. 
So today's plan, I'm going to introduce you to R&R &R Studio. You're going to make your first plot, and I'm going to sell you on this concept of a reproducible workflow. Our inspiration for today are, comes from the Financial Times, plots that you've probably seen uh, by John uh, Byrne Murdoch and his colleagues. Uh, they show the exponential growth of, uh, here we're showing uh, deaths in different countries. And uh, we're going to use this as our inspiration to make a slimmed down version of this plot uh, showing U.S. states of uh, Florida, New York, and Washington. So this is our goal today, and I'll teach you a little bit about R and R Studio along the way. We're going to work in R Studio Cloud. Uh, it's a new product from R Studio that is currently in beta testing. Uh, it's free. You can uh, get a free account and log on to our workspace where uh, when you pull up the files for this week, everything's there for you. Uh, I know that that environment is exactly what you need to do today's assignment, which is a great improvement over how we did it just a few years ago where everybody installed the programs on their computer and some people were on Mac, some people were on PC. Uh, that inevitably uh, meant that I spent some time uh, helping students install and figure out problems with their computer rather than working on data science problems. Uh, so, but now uh, we can do this in the cloud. And uh, if you log in, you'll have everything you need for this session. Now on the website, I do have RMD files that you could download and run locally. But in these live sessions, if you're following along live, uh, please log into our studio cloud. Uh, the optimal setup would be one where you have two monitors. Uh, now, not everybody has that, but if, if you do have an external monitor, uh, you're going to log into RStudio Cloud on your web browser and put that on your main monitor and move the Zoom connection or the video that you're watching to a secondary monitor. Uh, if you have a second device that's big enough, like a tablet, uh, you might go ahead and open your web browser on your main uh, computer screen and open Zoom uh, or the video from your device. Uh, and if you only have one screen, which is probably a lot of folks, then uh, it's important to learn the keyboard shortcuts, the toggle between either Zoom or the video, whichever you're using, and your web browser. So on a Mac, it's Command plus Tab, uh, Command and Tab, not the plus sign. And on Windows, it's Alt Tab. So take a moment, make sure you've got those uh, two uh, uh, keyboard shortcuts memorized because uh, toggling back and forth between these windows is going to help you to have uh, an efficient and not so frustrating session. So let's move over to our studio. This is what our studio cloud looks like. Uh, when you first sign in, you end up in your own workspace. This is where you can create projects for yourself. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit hamburger again. And I can see that uh, uh, this is the workspace shared with uh, everybody. And when you click on that workspace, you'll see a free workshop test and uh, week 01. Uh, so these are your projects. When you open this up, it's going to reproduce. It's going to spin up a, uh, a session of RStudio in the cloud for you to run your data analysis. And of course, you can look down the side here, the sidebar. Uh, they have a great guide uh, to understanding what RStudio cloud is all about, some new things in development. A great list of primers if you're new to R, which a lot of you are. I'm going to hopefully teach you a good bit, uh, but these are also great resources. There's so many things out there that you can use to jumpstart your learning, and you might start here. There's also a bunch of cheat sheets that uh, certainly early on I printed these out and had them next to me while I was working, and so you might think about downloading some of these cheat sheets. But we'll head back over to our workspace. And we'll open up the first one, the pre-workshop. Uh, and hopefully folks uh, had a chance to do this before watching the video, but we'll take a quick spin through it. Uh, these projects can uh, take a, a minute or two to uh, spin up. And I imagine your uh, internet connection has something to do with that. But we'll wait for this project to come up. And uh, what we're going to focus on is uh, the structure of uh, an R markdown file. Uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, our markdown is uh, a very flexible format where uh, if, you, if you take a look at our studio's page here, I think this icon really tells it that we're starting with something in R, but the output can be 
uh, HTML, it can be uh, a dashboard, it can be a PDF, it can be a Word document, it can even be uh, an ebook. Uh, so from one type of document, we can go out to many others. Uh, and if you look at the gallery here, uh, you can see that there's HTML reports, PDF reports, these Tufty handouts, uh, HTML widgets that are great to put on a website, shiny apps, these flex dashboards that we're gonna talk about uh, in a few weeks, uh, different presentations, and we're gonna work on one of those formats today, uh, being able to create a book right in our studio, uh, websites like uh, the, uh, the website for this uh, workshop series is all made from uh, R Markdown uh, and also lots of templates for creating uh, scientific articles and other types of uh, reading materials. So let's take a look at uh, our um, R Studio uh, layout here. Now, uh, this may not be open for you, so go to files and click on my first RMD. It's gonna open the file you see here uh, in the source window. And your panes might look a little bit different than mine in terms of their layout, but I'll show you how to change that in a minute. Uh, so this is an RMD file. And at the top we have uh, metadata. This is the, the sort of YAML heading and we can make all the specifications here that are gonna tell uh, R what we want our document to look like. And in this case, we're going to output to HTML. We're just going to create a report that's basically an HTML page, a web page. And uh, you have chunks, these gray pieces are where R evaluates code, and it's mixed in here with prose. So the, the text behind your report. So here's a heading, uh, here's some text, a first paragraph, a second paragraph. This is using a language called Markdown that you'll see is quite easy to learn. This is a uh, uh, going to make the word knit in bold, right? Here's a link to uh, uh, rstudio.com. Uh, we can run the first chunk just by hitting play. That's a little play uh, triangle. It doesn't do much for us because it's more for knitting. But when we click the next one, it's going to give us a summary of the car's data set right inside uh, our document window here. We can do the same thing for plots. We can plot uh, this uh, pressure data set, and here, uh, here you see it appears right in our document. But the real magic happens when we knit this file. So you can see it compiles it or knits it together into a uh, HTML file that we could publish on a few different outlets. We could send the HTML file to someone and they could open it in a browser very easily. And our plot is included, our uh, data analysis is included, all in one step. So we've combined our writing uh, and our analysis in one literate uh, programming document. And that's the real, uh, the real magic here of our markdown. From a reproducibility standpoint, if we decide that we wanted to uh, make a change to our analysis, right? We had more data come in or we realized we made a mistake, which happens all the time. All you do is fix it in your code chunks, hit knit again, and your document is going to produce itself one more time. No more going back and forth from your uh, uh, statistical program, whatever you're using, whatever software, no more going back and forth from that output to your Word document and transferring, copying and pasting or typing results from one to another. And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, I made a mistake. I have to go back and do it all over again and create my figures, create my tables. What we're going to show you is how to do it all in one reproducible workflow. So that's an RMD file. We're going to go back up to the, uh, uh, the main page here and jump into today's file, week 01. So again, it might take you just a minute to uh, bring this project up. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some data today that comes from the New York Times that they've compiled from other sources. Here is the GitHub page. GitHub's a, a version control uh, repository. And uh, this is the one for the New York Times for their COVID-19 data. And you can see here that they're updating state level data and county level data on a, on a daily or maybe even more frequent basis than that. And they have these raw CSV files 
These are data files. You can see where uh, we have date, state, a FIPS code for the state, the number of cases and the number of deaths. Uh, and so those are five variables uh, and all the data are separated by commas. So it's a CSV file, comma separated file. And what we're gonna do, this is just on a web page, essentially. So we're gonna tell R where to go and find the data and to bring it in directly without having to download anything and then separately import it into R. We're gonna do it all in uh, one step. So here we are back in uh, R Studio. And again, this layout looks exactly like it would look on your computer if you were running R Studio locally and not in the cloud. So it's a, an exact uh, replica of that. And you can open up the uh, week 01 RMD file. Now let's get uh, our panes looking uh, how I prefer them to be. Uh, so I'm gonna teach this way. So it'll be easier if you follow along and go to tools and global options. I just went to tools and global options. And in the pane layout, I'm gonna change it so my source document is in the upper left, my console is in the upper right, and then the only thing I have down here is history, which I'm gonna minimize and everything else is over here. So source, console, uh, history, and everything else. So when I do that, you see everything shifts around a little bit. My source document is still up here. I'm gonna minimize history. So I'm looking mainly at my source file and I can move these around to uh, however I'd like. I'm gonna bring this one down just a little bit to see more of my console. And the console is like an interpreter. You see the, the cursor is flashing. R is waiting for you uh, to do something. You can do something as simple as one plus one and uh, R is a great calculator. It's gonna tell you that the answer is two. Uh, but you're gonna see how much more it can do in a moment. Now this is a markdown file, again, an R markdown file, where we have a, a, a title. This is our metadata, again, up top. And we're telling it that the output is gonna be a, a, a slide presentation. Uh, so we're gonna make a slide deck today. We're gonna first work solely within the RStudio interface, and then at the end, we're gonna bring it all together by knitting. Uh, this first chunk is where we're gonna specify how we want this, uh, uh, how I want our output to look across the documents. So we're setting some global options here. We're saying generally we want to reproduce the uh, code chunks, that we want people to see the code that we're running, but we don't want to print any warnings. We don't want to print any messages. So we can go ahead and uh, just run that one. And uh, here we are to our step where we need to get some data. Uh, so again, this is a markdown chunk. These chunks always start with three back ticks and then uh, R inside of brackets. Uh, we can again play those chunks right here uh, or we can knit the whole thing together at once. So we can hit the uh, triangle button here and we're gonna notice that we have something new in our environment tab. We have this object called NYT underscore ST underscore URL. And you can see here, it's just a string, it's the URL. Uh, that where where our, our data are going to reside. So if we wanted, we could copy this and uh, print it out from the console. It's just going to tell us what that object stands for. Now, if I wanted, I could um, I could uh, I could call it the word object, and I could make my object standing for URL uh, be assigned to the word object. So now, when I type object, it still gives me the URL. You could say X is equal to five. And then you could say uh, X plus two is equal to seven, right? Where X stands for five, because we assigned it. So when I'm going like that, that's my assignment operator. So whatever on the left is going to equal whatever on the right. Now, naming objects is uh, usually a personal preference. Uh, so what you saw up here was snake case, where we're using the underscores. Uh, you could also use uh, camel case, right? NYT state URL, right? And you can make that uh, equivalent to the other one, right? So we can make, and uh, we can assign and reassign objects in R. So all we've done so far is we've just uh, told R what's going to be a placeholder for our URL. 
uh, in the next chunk here, right, this is our next code chunk. Uh, and uh, since we're making slides, this is, imagine a slide deck and everything I have highlighted is going to be the next slide. So everything starts with this header and the slide's gonna be titled, get the data. And everything on this slide uh, uh, will, everything that's highlighted will appear on this slide. Now our code chunk is, our next code chunk is here, uh, and it's going to run our code, but uh, you could, if you wanted, insert uh, another type of code chunk. So I could say, okay, I need one more R code chunk here, and you'd have it. But you could also say, well, I want to incorporate some Python code, or some STAN code, or some SQL code. And what our studio is going to do is it's going to manage the process for you. It's going to say, well, here you want to use R to evaluate your code. Here you want to use Python, and we're going to knit everything together. Uh, so that's pretty powerful. Today we're only going to work in R, uh, but you could create code chunks of different programming languages. But in this code chunk, we're going to uh, use the function called read CSV. Now, anytime you see some uh, like a word or a string followed by uh, parentheses, you know that it's a function to say, um, uh, here are my instructions for doing something. And what does read CSV do? Well, it reads in that CSV file. So it's going to take the URL and it has another parameter we're passing to it. We're telling it something to do about factors. We don't have to worry about that. And we're going to assign it to NYT underscore ST. So when we do that, what happens? in the environment, we have a new uh, data file. Uh, so our data frame is here, uh, nyt underscore st, right? And we got that from reading in that CSV file. And when you want to know what a function does, you can put a question mark before it, read CSV, and we're going to find the help file. Now, throughout this series, you're going to realize that help files really are helpful. And this is going to be your first stop in figuring out how do I get the function to do what I want it to do and why is it not doing what I want it to do. You'll start with these help files and you'll read what the arguments are that it takes a file that you can also specify whether or not the file has headers and what the separation is. We just relied on the defaults uh, for read CSV, but the help files are uh, um, the way that you're gonna uh, figure out what a, what a function does. So when we used this function, we brought in this object uh, called a data frame, NYTST. So I can hit the arrow here and open it up and see that it has five different variables, date, state, the FIPS code, cases and deaths. Uh, I can also see that it has 1719 observations. Right? And here I can see that Washington State appears three times. So I kind of getting some sense that this is a, a long file uh, where units can uh, appear multiple times. So states can appear several times. And just above it, you can see that uh, it's appearing by date. So there's a value for the 21st, the 22nd, the 23rd for Washington. Uh, we can also just click on it directly. And it's going to open in a viewer. Uh, now, if you're used to doing uh, work in Excel, this might be a comforting view for you. Uh, the big difference is you can't edit this. Uh, we're, not, we're not editing the data directly from in here. And uh, that's a good thing because we want everything to be fully reproducible. But we can do things like sort. So we could sort by state, for instance, or we could filter and say, just give me all the uh, North Carolinas, for instance, right? Or give me uh, uh, a certain range of cases, for instance. But this is just for viewing purposes to get a sense of your data. So this chunk for us um, took that URL and we used the function read CSV to say, okay, we'll go out uh, to that URL, bring in the data and store it in an object called NYTST. Now I'm gonna explain uh, when we get a little bit further on why I'm using all these like silly back ticks uh, when I'm writing my prose. Um, this is gonna be for a, a text formatting. I want this to look like printed code. But here you see it's a little bit different. It looks like I'm using a placeholder of some kind. There are blank observations and blank variables. Well, you could probably guess that the answer that R is gonna stick in there is that there are 1719 observations 
and five variables. Why to go to all that trouble? Well, uh, the data is going to update. We know it's going to be updated later today or tomorrow. And so what we want to be able to do is without having um, writing, there are 17, 19 observations. And then I have to go check it later and see what it is now. And I have to say, well, now there are 18, 26. By putting this placeholder here, uh, R will just calculate it automatically. And when I make my slides, it'll put the right value in. So that's a reproducible workflow. Before we get too much farther though, we need to load some packages. Uh, R comes with a lot of base packages, uh, but users like you and me have contributed more than 15,000 additional packages to a repository called CRAN. Uh, you can find uh, additional packages on that GitHub site that I showed you earlier. Now, because we're working in RStudio Cloud, I've set the environment up for you. You don't have to install anything today. Installation is a one-time thing you do on your computer unless you're doing a big upgrade to R. Uh, you'll just install a package once. You can update it when there's a new version of it, but that installation, it just happens once. But every time you want to use the package, every time you want to do, you open a new file, you open a new analysis, you need to load those packages. And you load them with the library function. Okay? See again the word library, and then in parentheses, it's the name of the package. Uh, so if you're doing this locally and not on our studio, then you will need to go ahead and uh, run this code in the console. Uh, to run it, you have to uh, first delete these comments. Right? Anytime that R sees a pound sign inside of the code chunk, it knows to ignore it. So if we go ahead and get rid of these, we can highlight this and we can copy it and paste it here in the console, or we can just go to run and run these selected lines. And what that'll do is it's going to install these packages and then install this one from GitHub. But I, uh, I actually don't want to install those because they're already installed. I'm not going to take the time to do that. So I'm just going to comment those lines again. So we'll put those uh, hashtags back up, pound signs back up to uh, comment out that text. So when we run this chunk, R is not going to evaluate any of this. Uh, if we forgot and we tried to run this, R would tell us, I don't know what you want me to do. And our studio is trying to let us know that that's what R is going to say because it's giving us uh, a red X over here, letting us know that there's uh, a mistake somewhere in here. I'm going to comment that back again. I'm going to go ahead and run this and my libraries are uh, going to load, right? So my libraries have loaded and uh, now we're ready to move on to the next slide. Remember again, this is everything that's going to appear on our next slide in our final document. And the heading is uh, the pipe operator. Now, we're going to really get into this in a future class, but uh, uh, the pipe operator is a really useful way uh, to make a pipeline of your data analysis. And you're going to read from left to right, top to bottom, uh, and you speak this operator, this uh, 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 percent, uh, greater than percent, you can just say then. So when you read the code, uh, this object NYT underscore ST, uh, pipe, group by state, it's like saying, uh, we're going to start with the data, and then we're going to do something to the data, right? We're going to start with the data, and we're going to group it by the variable state, and then we're going to count it, okay? So when we run this chunk, it's going to uh, uh, count the observations uh, by state. Now, <clears throat> for some reason, for me, I am not seeing it uh, pop up uh, under here in my window, which I was expecting it to do. Uh, let me hit uh, restart. Uh, I found this happens a little bit with uh, our Studio Cloud. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, show you something new. We can run all the chunks up to this point again by hitting this button. And if I run the plus the arrow sign here, okay, I'm still not getting uh, um, some output to appear below here, which I'm expecting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. Uh, we had this problem in the live session for some students, not everybody. I'm just going to go back out and then reopen this project one more time. Uh, if you're running locally, this probably wouldn't happen to you. Uh, but let's, let's do this one more time and see if we can 
get the output to appear, and it does. That's great. So when I run that chunk, uh, I'm seeing uh, the output down here that I can kind of scroll through by going all the way next. Um, and it's giving me a count of states. So in this data set from the New York Times, um, how many times does every state appear? How many observations for every state? And South Carolina has 28, Pennsylvania has 28, and we can go um, all the way to the end, Wyoming has 23. We didn't assign this uh, to anything. There's no assignment operator. So when it behaves, our studio is just printing the output right below it. Now, we can make that a little bit nicer output when we, when we make our slides. Uh, the only thing different in this code chunk, right, this new slide we're doing down here, is that I added something called uh, cable and cable styling. So what it's going to do is it's going to produce a nicer uh, table for me. And you can see that table being uh, uh, printed here in the viewer and uh, right below the chunk. And it'll print a nice little table for me when I make my, uh, when I make my document, whatever I'm choosing to make. So just by adding uh, cable uh, and cable styling onto uh, this pipeline, I'm taking what I had before, which is just the computer generated output, uh, the default output, I should say. It's all, <laughs> the computer's doing all of it. But this is my default output, and here's a little bit nicer styling, optional. Um, and uh, when you make these plots, uh, you're going to realize pretty quickly that uh, you often have to do a good amount of wrangling to get the data in the right shape. Um, even clean data files, so-called clean data files, are rarely ready to just be plotted. You have to usually do something to get it uh, ready for plotting. And you're going to see a lot of that in this workshop series. Uh, now, for today, I'm not going to explain what's happening in this chunk. Uh, I'm not worried that you uh, understand all of these different functions because uh, we're trying to get to a different endpoint. But you can probably guess that you know, we're starting with the data. We're going to group by state again. All right, here's where we're going to make some new variables and we're going to filter, right? So we're going to limit our data set to say that we want daily deaths greater than or equal to three, right? And we only want to look at Florida and New York and Washington. That's basically what's happening here. So when we run this, um, we see output below when we're doing this interactively, but I set the chunk to hide so when we print to the slides, we're actually not going to print the uh, uh, the results of this of the results of this step. Um, I want to see it here while I'm working on it, but I don't want it to be in my slide deck. Uh, everything here is the same except for one new thing. There's one line 109 is new, and you see that assignment operator. So basically, we're taking everything here and we're assigning the output of that right the end of this pipe. We're assigning to an object called um, df uh, for data frame underscore deaths. So when I run that, I'll be able to come look in my environment and see that I have a new data frame called df underscore deaths with 55 observations and eight variables. I can look at that as I had looked at the other one before. And now that we can see that uh, here are our original variables, right? Uh, our data sets filtered, right? So it only includes New York, Florida, and Washington, like we told it to. And it has some new variables, daily deaths, um, days since the first time a state uh, had three deaths, and uh, something that we're going to do for the, uh, for the labeling that's not important for today. So the only thing different from the previous step was that we assigned uh, that result to uh, the data frame DF deaths. We're going to be able to use that now in our, in our plotting exercise. Now, ggplot, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on this next week because, well, we're, the whole session, uh, the whole seminar series is based around plotting. So we need to dig into ggplot. But I'm going to show you just a little bit today to give you a sense of how powerful, but yet how easy it is to use. Um, so uh, if we run this first chunk, uh, what we're telling R is basically, I, I want you to make a plot and I want you to use my data. And if you handed me an Excel file and just said, make a plot, I wouldn't know what to do either. What variables do you want to use? What question are you trying to answer? Or do you want a bar chart? What, what should I do with your data? And that's what R is telling you. I'm ready for your plot, but I don't know what you want me to do. 
And we'll talk about how this AES function is going to be redo that first mapping, right? And even without a whole lot of study, you can probably figure out that uh, X is going to be our X axis. So we want days on the X axis, deaths on the Y axis, and a few other parameters. So when we run this, okay, we have a little bit more of a plot here. Uh, we know that well, R is giving us back what we told it, that days are on the x-axis and deaths uh, are on the y-axis. We didn't tell it any more than that, so it did not come back with any more than that. But we're headed in the right direction. Here, now we need to add uh, some sort of geometric object. We, do you want a line? Do you want a bar plot? What do you want to go on, on that plot space? And we're going to say that we want to align. So we're going to talk about these geom functions. Uh, and uh, we're adding a layer. So we're using the plus sign to say, add the next layer. So take what we had and add the next layer. And now, finally, we have something that looks like uh, what we're trying to do for today. We have over days, uh, deaths over days. And uh, we have our three states here with three separate lines. So we're headed in the right direction. But as we do this, we can build up our plot in stages. We don't have to repeat our code, our code every time. Uh, you see an assignment operator, so you can guess that all of this is going to be assigned to the value of P. So if I run just that, and if I type P in my console, well, there's my plot. So that's the first part of it. And then I can just start with that first part of it. I can add some more stuff to it and I can assign it back to P. So now once I run this, P is going to stand for a lot more. Right. So now what did it do? Well, it, it changed the scale uh, to log 10. Uh, it changed the breaks and it did something uh, to make our labels a little bit nicer. But the key part to get from this is that we can build up our plots in stages and uh, assign them to names. We don't have to keep repeating ourselves. Now, uh, the last step, we're going to kind of start with what you see here, right? That's currently, R knows that to be P. So we're going to start with P and we're going to add a few more things to it. Uh, we're going to use a special theme uh, from uh, the outlet 538. They've uh, made a package so you can make plots uh, that look like their graphics. Uh, we're going to do a few things to the title to shift it around. We're going to add some uh, labels. Uh, these are things we're going to talk about in the next class. Uh, and you can fiddle all day with these plots. Our uh, GG plots are really powerful that can help you make uh, publication quality graphs, whether your publication is an, an academic journal or uh, 538. So when we hit this, uh, nothing appears because we assigned everything to P, right? So I can go over here and type in P and we've reached the end. This is the plot we were looking to make, right? Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and uh, knit this, right? This is what we've been waiting to do. This is working interactively, but now we want to go ahead and knit this together. It's processing. It's almost done. And the output, like we told it, is going to be a uh, slide deck. So I'm going to go back to the beginning of our slide deck with our title that we defined at the top of the file, my first plot. And you're seeing it's combining the uh, slide heading right, uh, with the, the pound signs there. Uh, the pros of our uh, slide, this is a markdown chunk. It includes the chunk itself. In this case, I told you those placeholders were turned into something better. So those placeholders turned into 17, 19 observations and five variables. Right? So you can see the benefit of um, uh, using those placeholders. Uh, it can put the output directly in here. So we did the output like this, just the, the default output. And then we came along and said, well, let's make a little bit nicer output. It's not going to fit on our slide, but uh, you can see that uh, there's a lot more styling we can do to even make our tables uh, look publication quality. All right, so we can show our work. We can turn this code off if we don't want to show it. Uh, here we are making our uh, first empty plot, right? Just the call to ggplot. 
then we are adding on our uh, axes, right? Because we finally mapped it, told it what X is going to be, told it what Y is going to be. And then we said, okay, well, we want you to now uh, draw a line, right? Draw the lines for the data. Uh, and uh, we come here to the end. Now I can see already, there's something I don't quite like uh, that uh, the, um, our, our subtitle is broken. And I think I did that so that it printed on this screen nicely, but uh, so I made a mistake. And what I can do is go back and say, uh, I, I, I put a line break here and it doesn't really work that way. So I'm gonna move it back to where it should be. I'm gonna knit it again Mistakes aren't that big of a deal. Uh, and here we go. So now it runs over and I'd have to figure out now, how do I fix this? If I'm, if you know, this is really uh, distressing me, I can figure, and it is, and I can figure out how to fix that. But now my uh, subtitle, which is the more important piece, fits in here and looks right. Right, so uh, next time we're going to uh, learn more about ggplot and what it can do, and uh, you'll you'll be amazed at the type of plots that you can uh, make with R and uh, ggplot.